Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about my wish list for WWDC 2021, which is coming up pretty soon here. I wanted to talk about kind of what I'm most looking forward to, and I guess I'll say with a big disclaimer, I guess hopeful for, because you never really know with Apple. We might be, you know, super thrilled to see what the, the new stuff that we get, and we might be extremely disappointed as well. So I just wanted to share some of my thoughts and what I'm personally looking forward to. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys are looking forward to as well. So toss it down in the comments before we start or afterwards or uh, yeah, let me know. So that all said and that you subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. Let's get into my wish list. So let's see. I've got some notes over here. So I'm going to start off my wish list with SwiftUI. So I know a lot of you might not be, you know, working with SwiftUI or even a fan of it, but I've started to dabble quite a bit with SwiftUI and it's pretty cool. But there's still a lot of limitations, which is, you know, kind of expected and kind of, uh, you know, why SwiftUI gets like trashed on. Um, and one of the biggest uh, like shortcomings of SwiftUI right now is a lot of the SwiftUI stuff under the hood is implemented in UIKit, which is like kind of funny because it defeats the purpose of it being SwiftUI to a degree. And the two biggest ones that come to mind uh, are lists and scroll views. So for those of you who didn't know, lists under the hood are still implemented as table views and scroll views under the hood are still UI scroll views uh, wrapped you know, in a fancy little object for uh, SwiftUI. So the fact that they're wrapped, you know, that doesn't really matter what they're implemented in. The thing that I care about more so is when you work with some of these UI kit components, and I still work with them today, things like table view and collection views, which I'll get to in a minute, you have an abundance of granular control over different lifecycle events. So take like a table view delegate, for example, in a data source. Not only can you do things like, you know, like when the cell was tapped or the height or the row or moving it around, but you can also do like with the data source, like prefetching and, you know, changing parts of the data based on snapshots if you're using diffable data sources. And I think a lot of that stuff you can achieve with SwiftUI, but the farther and farther you start to go down this rabbit hole of parity with the SwiftUI list and a table view, the more apparent it becomes that it's it's not super straightforward to set this stuff up. And maybe this is me talking of using UI table views for so many years, I just know how to do it now. But man, it is not friendly for someone who's you know new to SwiftUI, working with lists, and wants to do anything um, other than the basic stuff that's available. So... That's a similar case of scroll views. With scroll view delegates, um, we do get a lot of functionality. Whereas in SwiftUI, for those of you who are familiar, if you want to just scroll to some element in a scroll view, you got to use this thing called like a scroll view reader, which is fine. And I understand why Apple went down that route. But again, the same challenge kind of stands where scroll views have so much granular control and you can build out really, really nice functionality um, using them in UI kit. A really popular thing people build out is like a stretchy header at the top of a scroll view or a table view, which is basically the same thing. You can do that with SwiftUI, but it's a little more janky. Like you have to use an offset and this and that, and I won't get into the weeds of it, but point being, Apple needs to extend more modifiers or if not a delegate something to make you know, make it apples to apples, no pun intended. Um, I've been waiting all day to use that pun. But uh, but that's SwiftUI, and that also, uh, this will, I guess, will transition me to uh, to collections. So this is in the in the scope of SwiftUI and in UIKit. So I think last year, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, Apple introduced, or two years ago, uh, UI collection view compositional layouts, which help you build these beautiful, dynamic-looking layouts with... Uh, groups and items and sections and for those of you who have used it before if you ever wanted to build like a landscape carousel instead of you know having like a collection view in a table view cell you can use this thing called orthogonal scroll now and it really really gives you flexibility to build out really nice uis which you know prior to this being available were a little complex to put together and this is why you would see them mainly in large you know, big tech uh, company apps like Pinterest and Instagram and whatnot. So compositional uh, collection layouts are awesome, but they don't exist in SwiftUI. <laughs> so this again further kind of uh, proves my point, I guess, to a degree that 
you could build it out, but man, it's such a pain. So Apple needs to, you know, bring something to Swift UI uh, for grids and how grid items are set up where it's easier to match what a compositional layout offers. Now, changing gears from Swift UI, for those of you who are tired of me talking about it, even in UI Kit, I would love to see collection views go a step further. So some of you might have um, used third-party frameworks like IG List Kit from Instagram, which is what backs the Instagram feed and their Discover page and whatnot. And there's a couple other ones out there. I think there's one called Composition Kit also, which um, is basically similar to compositional layout, but it gives you more granular control uh, of your sections. It introduces this concept of a section controller, and you can actually, instead of having like one controller that manages the whole table or collection, you can have you know a subset of controllers. And you can do this a little bit today with Diffable Data Source, but the setup is not very nice. It's kind of a pain to set up, and frankly, it gets confusing really fast. Um, if you look at IG List Kit or some of those other frameworks that let you do this, it's a breeze to use those to set it up. And I would love to see Apple extend their work on collection view and configurable cells uh, to make it more granular where we can do things like section controllers and you know, uh, updating stuff with even more animations. I know right now Diffable data sources, we can use those animations, but there's a lot of room for Apple to expand this considering that the majority, I don't want to say the majority, actually a lot of apps, I'll say, do rely on collection view quite a bit, right? Anything that's not like a game, you're probably going to need to learn collection view at one point in time. And it's nice if you don't, you know, how to know how to customize like a layout to have something out of the box, which is semi straightforward. So that's my rant on Swift UI and collection views. Let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about widgets. So widgets are cool. They were introduced last year. Uh, there's a lot of pretty big apps now to build out custom widgets, things like Widgetsmith and Color Widgets, and I built one of my own as well, actually. And I think it's really nice that we get these intents to configure widgets, um, and some people have taken it, you know, like a mile ahead of what Apple probably intended um, it to be used for. But there are certain things which are still a little um, hairy. So Apple kind of, uh, you know, pushes this notion of, Widgets are meant to be lightweight. Don't try to build an ad uh, or build a whole app you know, on the home screen. Yes, someone tried to put an ad on the home screen. I thought it was hilarious. But there is like, uh, there are, there's like a middle ground where people make like network calls, for example, right? Let's say you wanna get weather data and you wanna show it in the widget. And the way that you can update the, the sequence of widget, um, I think they call it uh, snapshots for a given time series in the widget, in widget kit, is, is not great, right? It, it works. It's basically kind of based on how complications on watchOS work for those of you who have worked with it, but it's not the most flexible. And honestly, it's probably by design, so people don't abuse it. But I'd love to see Widget Kit get expanded in certain ways where we can go ahead and build out more uh, immersive widget experiences. I know there's a game on the App Store, it's like, I totally forget what it's called, but the little dinosaur that like jumps over stuff, it's like, it's built into Chrome as well. Um, but somebody made a widget out of it and I thought it was the coolest thing. And I actually haven't had a chance to take a look at it and, you know, kind of cobble together how it was made. But I'm sure it was quite a bit of uh, work in like Sprite Kit and uh, wrapping into Swift UI and whatnot, but I'd love to see widget kit get expanded with more capabilities and maybe even more like sizes of widgets and like positioning and things like that. Um, you know, just my wish list. We'll see if it actually happens with Apple, you know, keeping things close, keeping things closed out. But let me take a look at my list here. We talked about collection views. All right, photos and camera. So a lot of you might know, or some of you might not know, I love photo and camera based applications. Uh, I've worked on many of my own photo and camera based applications. Best nine is the one that I've shared here on this channel. Uh, things like, you know, building out custom cameras, filtering, cropping, uh, streaming video. I think it's the coolest thing. I don't know why I like it so much, but I definitely do. So I'm excited to see what Apple extends uh, in their camera APIs. Um, so I know the last thing that I saw from them, I don't know if it was last year or the year prior that I was pretty excited about, was when they brought, uh, you know, uh, concurrent camera support. So you can have basically a viewfinder on your app for the back camera, and you can have the front camera at the same time. 
And like immediately I thought this is like a great way to build like a reaction type application where people like post their reactions when they watch something or do something. Um, you know, someone built that already, but uh, I thought it was pretty cool. So I'd love to see, especially now with like, there's a lot of audio apps out there like Clubhouse and like, I know Twitter's ripping it off and Facebook is ripping it off. So I think with video and audio, there's a lot of room for Apple to expand functionality. And I think it's kind of a delicate area because you want to keep privacy, you know, top of mind, uh, especially given their new privacy push or I guess commitment. Um, and similar for photos, right? So we originally, way back in the day, had Asset Library, which got deprecated in favor of the Photos framework. And I think the Photos framework is great, but I also think it's still a little limited. Um, for example, if you just want to read the user's photos, you, you have to do like this like weird query and like specify the size. It works, but it could definitely be cleaned up and extended. Um, and then also I'll tack into this category, I guess. Um, so Apple offers like LiDAR uh, APIs to get like depth when you're using the camera to figure out different things. And I think that's really powerful, especially coupled with like AR kit. There's a lot of apps out there that already use it to do things like, um, you know, a navigation app. You can see like on the road or on the sidewalk, like where you need to walk to, you know, get to your destination. Of course, TikTok and Snapchat use it 24 seven for their filters, which people love. Um, and I think it, it'd be cool to see them expand that further. Um, I know the iPad is pretty big with, you know, the LiDAR or whatnot. So we'll see how that goes. I'm not too sure what else they could add there, but I'm sure Apple can do something with their computational photos team. You know, they never, uh, they never disappoint too, too much. So let's move on to, let's see, what else do I have on my list here? Let's take a peek. All right. So two more things on my list, um, that I'll cap out with. So, uh, the next thing is core ML. So I think machine learning is this kind of black box thing, especially on mobile and iOS, um, where if you know how to use it, it can be extremely powerful, but the large majority of devs in iOS or even Android, I would say, don't understand it. They are a little intimidated by it. It's not the most straightforward thing to do. Maybe you can follow a tutorial here and there, but building your own thing out with uh, Apple's own create ML app is not super straightforward. So, what would be really cool, in my opinion, is to see Apple um, extend their library of models. So if you don't know already, Apple does have a bunch of uh, machine learning models available on their website on developer.apple.com. And I think they're meant to be like kind of starter models uh, that you need to like fine tune for your application. But it'd be pretty cool to see them extend that as like a whole library where you can search different models and I don't know, make a central place for people to share their models. and make the process of using create ML on your desktop to tweak a model just easier, right? A lot of people don't know how tagging works and neural networks and we often get stuck in like the jargon and like this like black hole of like machine learning vocabulary where like nobody actually knows how to use it and integrate it into your app. Um, there's a lot of use cases for machine learning, not just, you know, for the big tech guys out there like TikTok and uh, Instagram that use it to drive their like algorithms and for their feeds and whatnot, but you could use it in pretty basic apps. So I'll, I'll share my personal um, usage. So in best nine, we use it to, uh, so for those of you who don't know, best nine is like a year end application where you can see your top nine photos on Instagram. I launched it many, many years ago. Um, it's my top downloaded app. And now we have a lot of features in it, like creating a video and adding effects and filtering and whatnot. So because there's so many features, there's kind of this challenge of like, okay, if we want to help discoverability of features, how do we do it? And machine learning is what we kind of use now to uh, nudge people based on their interaction with the app uh, in terms of upsells, right? It doesn't have to be like an in-app purchase upsell, but it could be um, something like a feature upsell of, hey, you did this, you might like this, right? It might be a totally free feature, but we don't just want to bother the user with like a million features that frankly they don't care about. So. That's machine learning. Hopefully we'll see Core ML4. I'm curious to see what they package in there, hopefully making it easier for folks to get started. I know Core ML also is hands in hand with uh, their computer vision framework, super creatively named vision, as well as their natural language processing and speech frameworks. I think I'd love to see a computer vision framework bump because their vision APIs work really well to scan documents and whatnot, but they're not, you know, they're not the most flexible and open for third-party developers, us basically, to go in and like tweak stuff. They get the job done, but they're fairly bare bones. And the final thing that I've got here is networking. 
So some of you might have seen this already. Swift 6 has a couple uh, RFCs in there, a couple things, um, discussions for uh, improving networking calls in Swift as a programming language. Now, I don't know if this is like a WWDC ask. This is more of a, I hope Apple, you know, extends like operation queue or dispatch queue to be a little cleaner. Um, a lot of languages nowadays, modern languages, have this concept of like an await task, and it does exist in iOS as well, but it's it's a little antiquated. Um, so if you guys actually Google Swift 6 networking, maybe I'll link it in the description down below, you'll find a discussion where uh, people are proposing for Swift 6 to have improved networking, particularly around multiple asynchronous calls um, that need to execute uh, one after another. Similar to a promise, if you're familiar with JavaScript, it's kind of like a closure, not really. I'll have to link it down below instead of getting into the weeds of it. Um, so I'm pretty excited to see that, but I'm more so excited to see how Apple can further include that into things like dispatch queue and dispatch group. Because frankly, like using like AF networking in like a large application might not be feasible. Um, a lot of times people build out their own networking stacks and there's security involved and all this like nonsense that no one really enjoys. Maybe somebody enjoys it. I would just love to see Apple take networking a step further. Um, even the fact that, like we have like reachability today to like figure out if you're connected to like the network and like what network you're on. The amount of effort that you need to go through to like set that up to figure out if your app is connected to the internet is just kind of dumb. Like there literally should be like a, there should be some type of like object you can say is online. And then if you care about, uh, you know, like what type of connection you have, 5G or LTE, you know, there should be a simple way to get that too. I know there's ways to get that and I've actually covered it on this channel as well uh, already, but it's not simple. So networking is something I'm looking forward to, something a little lower in the stack and yeah, I mean, those are like the things that I had on my list. I mean, I'm definitely excited for a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, I'll be combing through the WWDC announcements. I have a feeling that this year is going to be a big polish here for iOS 15, uh, incremental update to Big Sur. Watch OS 8, I don't really know if there's something I'm too excited for. I was very happy they brought SwiftUI to it. I would like to see HealthKit improvements because HealthKit is still not the easiest thing to work with, which is why I kind of avoid making videos on it because it's it's a little complicated because you need to do a lot of permissioning and queries. And uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what else we get. I'm sure we're gonna get a whole lot more. I'll be covering DubDub and as you know, the material and videos go up, I'll go through all the videos and content to make sure I, I keep y'all updated here on the channel. So that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, I super enjoyed doing my Swift UI UI kit comparison video, which is why I'm going to continue these videos like uh, like this, where I get to share some of my thoughts and talk to you guys, so on and so forth. Uh, it seemed like a lot of you guys, uh, you know, appreciated that video, liked the video, love getting comments from all of you. So, yeah, I mean, if you got any thoughts, if you have anything in particular that you're excited for, definitely drop it down below in the comments. Destroy the like button if you're into the video for the YouTube algorithm. Helps, uh, you know, YouTube push the video out and grow the channel. And subscribe if you're into iOS and want to stick around for these types of videos, as well as a bunch of technical videos. So that's all I've got for you guys today. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.